The Better Man podcast is sponsored by. When we launched Art of Homage a few years ago, the goal was to create concepts so good that they led to conversations about Jesus. Whether you're in the mall, the airport, a restaurant, or church, we can express our faith and still look good while we do it. I think about Jordan Peterson. I think about Andrew Tate. I think about all these masculine figures in culture today that men gravitate to, that men imitate. And, and, and what's the problem? What's the problem with all these figures? What's happening, fam? Welcome to the Better Man Podcast. Per usual, I'm here with the crew, D, Manny, Isaac, so great to see you guys. I want to open this week with a question. When you think about manhood and masculinity, okay, specifically in the Bible, apart from King Jesus, who is the most manly, masculine figure in the Bible and why? First one that comes to mind, go. I'm going with King David. Come on. For so many reasons. Break it down. So I'm going with King David because uh, King David was, it's called a man after God's own heart. That yeah. alone, that statement alone. <laughs> That's real. Right, I could just drop the mic, <laughs> push the mic away on that one. That's real. A man after God's own heart um, because he was a worshiper. Oh, wow. He was a worshiper. True, true and through and through worshiper. Yeah. So that's why I'm selecting King David. Because yeah. he worshiped the Lord. Absolutely. Yeah. With no. Um, he wasn't perfect. Oh, yeah, not at all. But his heart was in the right place. Pure. That's it, man. Pure. See, God can work with a man that he, that he, that's not perfect. He can't work with one he can't trust. And he can trust King David. Come on. I, I got I to I gotta push back a little bit, though, and, and just to— just, <laughs> That's, and, like, the best, and, and, that's and, like the best line ever. Well, but, but, but I, mean, say, I mean, you know, I mean, could he really trust David, though? I mean, David. Uriah could. David killed. Yeah, right. So he killed Uriah, <laughs> right. and and he and he slept with Bathsheba. So yeah. I mean, can we? So what is that? Well, I mean, but obviously, so, but still, God. He was a man. God said he's a man after my own yes. heart. So what? What do you think with all that? Absolutely. So I got. I got to come back for that one. Yeah. Right. And the comeback for that one is the word repentance. Okay. There we he go. He can trust him because he was quick to repent. That's right. And turn. And he trusted him enough to hand him the keys of the kingdom. Absolutely. More so, he trusted him enough that the Messiah would come from his lineage. Absolutely. And that's the ultimate trust, mm -hmm. in my opinion. He said, hey, you're going to sit on this throne, and by the way, um, your seed, your lineage will always have this throne because from you is going to be King Jesus. Oh, absolutely. Now, David didn't know his name was King Jesus, but... but yeah. I mean, that was the promise fulfilled through David. Absolutely. So I love that. I love that his heart was right. God can, God can work with with somebody he can trust. Doesn't have to be perfect. That's right. Somebody he can trust. Yeah, yeah. got to trust yeah. you. A trustworthy man. That's good. That's good. Who you got, dude? man? I, I I was gonna say one, but I'm gonna go with two of them that I think about. First one is Moses, right? Okay. When Moses found out this cat was messing around with his people, man, he took his head off mm. and he ran. Right. So uh, I just like that, you know, rebellious spirit in Moses. But then I think about Solomon and what he but, asked for. But was it rebellious or was, was he doing the right thing? He was defending the weak? He was defending the weak, but uh, there's still a call not to murder. And, right? and, and here's the deal. To, in today's culture, man, defending the weak probably is seen as being rebellious. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's I agree with you 100%. Yeah. That's real. And I just think about Solomon, not because of all the concubines and all that stuff y'all might be thinking about. But <laughs> why you put that on us? Yeah, I did. I just had to. But uh, I just right? think about the humility and what he asked for from God. Come on. And it was wisdom. Yeah. Absolutely. And if there's, you know, anything that I think I need on a daily base basis is wisdom. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. And so I'm I'm gonna make a tie real quick because you said, you know, uh man after God's own heart. Mm -hmm. And you said wisdom. So these referencing kings where God tells Solomon, basically, I've given you everything, but ask for anything else, and I'll give it to you. And our translation in Scripture says he asked for wisdom or an understanding mind. Mm -hmm. That's how some translates it. The actual Hebrew says he asked for a listening heart. 
Mm. That's how that's translated. Wow. David was a man after God's own heart. Solomon asked for a listening heart. Wow. That God would speak to that and shape it. So I'm starting to see a theme here. We didn't plan this. I'm that's because we, we black. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take that one out. Man. <laughs> I'm just playing. Like, I'm not sure I would say. Here, here, here's one thing I'll yeah. say to add to both of those, and I think this is important just to just to know. Both of these guys didn't end well, necessarily. David came back, and it was all that, but, but after he committed his sin, the rest of his life was plagued with tough family times oh, and his son terrible. coming to kill him and, you know, all these different things. Daughter. Yeah, and then Solomon as well, who like turned to idolatry, and so, you know, totally. I think, I think, I think it's just important to know that even though we, we can be men after God's own heart, we can fail. Satan is patient; he'll wait. Yeah. He'll wait decades for us to fall, and wait till we're in that moment. But you talk about two guys who, you know, we all look up to these guys. Yeah, in the beginning of their life. And then sure. we look at the, I and mean, we don't like to talk about that other part, but I think it's it's something we got to take a lesson from oh, all, all the way. So, and, and Manny, I'm shocked, not shocked. I shouldn't say I'm shocked. What you just said is a challenge. So, for our listeners who read the Bible, pay attention. It's interesting how many men in the Bible fall in the second half of their life. And to your point, Satan has patience in spades. Satan has no problem waiting 20, 30 years to bring down your marriage, waiting 20, 30 years to bring down your ministry, waiting 20, 30 years to ruin your reputation, the career you've built. Your, he has no problem waiting that long. He can outweigh anybody. Even We've even seen some guys, after they die, even oh, yeah. Satan will, will even destroy their reputation and all their legacy after yeah. that happens their as heritage. well. Uh, you, can't, you can't outfast Satan. He never eats. You can't outwork Satan. He never sleeps. The only area you can beat Satan in is humility because he has none. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you're talking about, that that pure heart. Absolutely. That's what you're talking about, that listening heart. It's a humble heart. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's, that's key, right? The heart piece I'm wanting to go back to because even though, as you were mentioning, Manny, the second half of these men, their demise, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't pretty. But here's the thing. The Bible tells us to guard our hearts. Yeah, and I think what happened at the end of King David's life, or at the in, end of uh, King Solomon's life, is they removed the guardrails. And they exposed their heart to things yeah. that they shouldn't expose yeah. it to. And because that exposure was there, it weakened their discernment. And they started to make decisions out of a weakened discernment, which caused their demise. Yeah. 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 That's really good. Mm. We're gonna come back to that. Mm. Manny, who you got? Who's the character um, that comes to yeah, mind? Yeah, for me it's just you destroyed ours. <laughs> Thank you, Manny. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't destroying him. <laughs> uh, it, for me it's Barnabas. Barnabas is one of those guys, he's humble. He's a he's a guy who's a lot of people don't know about in the New Testament. Uh, but he's he's one of those guys who well, it, just just a quick uh, quick story for him. He he was a guy who brought Paul after Saul, after um, after Paul had the encounter with God, and he was shunned by all the believers in Jerusalem, uh, Barnabas was the one when Paul came back and was trying to meet with people. Nobody wanted to meet with him because they were all afraid of him. Barnabas is like, "Listen, I'll bring you in. I'll I'll stand up for you in front of everybody else, and I'll vouch for you." So he brought him into the circle. Later on, when Paul is trying to get a ministry going, nothing's working. Barnabas is like, here, you come over, help me at my church. You be my associate pastor. And he learned how to pastor under Barnabas. Mm. And Barnabas did that later with John Mark. When Paul didn't want to take John Mark with him as well, Barnabas, again, he's like, hey, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a second chance. And because of that, if you think about that, the majority of the New Testament was written by Mark and Paul. Mm. And you think of those two guys, and those all came because of because of Barnabas. And wow. so you you've got a you've got a guy who's a very understated guy who is about discipleship and discipling men mm. and and poured into two guys who now have continued to have an impact today. Come on. So wow. I love Shout, Barnabas. I love that. Shout out to Dr. Jonathan Murphy. Yeah. From DTS, yeah, my preaching professor 
was a mentor of mine. He's the new senior pastor at Stonebriar. Stonebriar, that's right. And uh, he, a lot of his academic work was on Barnum. That's right. He, he just had a book just come out of. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So good. And I love many what you said. The second chance. Mm. I heard a, I think it was an Army Ranger, talking about jumping out of a plane. Right. And he said, most people think that if you jump out of a plane and your parachute doesn't open, that you die upon impact. But that's not what happens. He said, the body, because of the buoyancy and the water makeup, that you actually hit the ground and you bounce about 10 to 12 feet. He said, but when you hit the ground, you shattered every bone in your body. And it's on the bounce when you hit the ground the second time that all those bones puncture your organs and you basically bleed out. Okay, and I'm like, that's the most horrifying thing I've ever heard. A, and why are you sharing this? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, because the majority of life is catching people on the bounce. That's, good. that's what we're called to do. So I may not be able to prevent you from sleeping with bad sheep, but I may not be able to prevent you from whatever it is. But what I can do is not let you hit that second time. I can catch you on the bounce. Right. And, and, and Barnabas was that guy catching people on the bounce, man, which we all can do that. We all can do that. For me, for me, it's, it's, it's two people easy. It's, it's Caleb, Old Testament Caleb. He's Joshua's ride or die. Right. You remember the story, the 12 spies go out to spy the promised land. They come back, 10 are afraid. Joshua and Caleb, man, if the Lord be for us to be against us, let's go take the land. Um, the other ten are so upset. They tell Joshua and Caleb because they've almost got Mo. They've almost got um, no. Not who Moses. I'm thinking about Moses. Yeah. yeah, they've almost got Moses convinced. And the other ten say, "Man, if y'all don't shut up, we're going to stone you." Well, Moses goes with the other ten. You know the story. That takes them into the wilderness for forty years. They get back to the promised land forty years later. Moses is no longer in charge. Uh, he, he still made it into the kingdom, but he didn't get to go into the land because he disobeyed. Right? There's another lesson in that. Consequences. There's another yeah. lesson in that. But Joshua was in charge, and they're standing on the precipice of the promised land, and Caleb looks at Joshua and says, Hey, listen, I'm twice as old, but the Lord made me just as strong. Give me the land. Give me the hill country, he says that the Lord had promised me, which you know is the hardest piece to take. Yeah. Taking the hill is the hardest. And he does it. He does it. And what is the Bible? In Numbers, in the book of Numbers, it talks about Caleb. God is talking about Caleb. And God says, my son Caleb, a man of a different spirit. He was different. There was something yeah. different about him, right, that set him apart from all the other men. Something different about Caleb, right? And we can go into what that was, but I just love that there's a difference, right? Yeah. And then the other person that comes to mind is Andrew. That's my New Testament character. I love Andrew. We see Andrew three times in the New Testament. And what I love about him is every time we see him, he's bringing someone to Jesus. That's so the right. first time we see him, he's bringing Peter to Jesus. He goes and tells his brother, hey, man, I found the Messiah. Come and see. Second time we see him, He's bringing a little boy with a lunchbox to Jesus because everybody's hungry. And says, Jesus, I don't, know what you, I don't know what you can do with this, but I know you can do something. Yeah. Right? And then the next time we see him, it's during Passover. The Bible says there are two Gentiles that are looking for Jesus. And they run into Thomas. And they said, hey, do you know where Jesus is at? And Thomas says, let me go get Andrew. He can take you to him. Yeah, I love yeah. that. I love that. Let me go get the one who know. Come on. Yeah. He can bring you to him, yeah. right? He's always, always pointing people to Jesus, man. And that's what I think a real man, a godly man does, is he points people to Jesus, which is the opposite of what we're seeing today in culture. Yeah. Which really is 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 the crux of this show. You know, I just got I just got reamed at a men's conference because I bagged on Jordan Peterson a little bit. And I guess I guess his nephew was in the crowd because this dude this dude acted like I just talked about his family, yeah. right? And uh, he came at me, man, full throat. He was he, he he was upset. But I think about Jordan Peterson. I think about Andrew Tate. I think about all these masculine figures in culture today that men gravitate to, that men imitate, 
And, and, and what's the problem? What's the problem with all these figures? The Better Man podcast is sponsored by Aroga Drive. Drive is the only natural product that provides sustained energy and helps boost your mood. Check out betterman-drive.com. The problem with them, this is my opinion, is that they, they give off the idea that they know the way. And most men are confused about what the way is. So if I see you being successful, if I see you with all the ladies, and if I see you with the map, the guide, I'm going where, where you've gone because I want what you got. But when you have an understanding of what it means to be a man, uh, and when you know the way, when you've had a dad or someone to disciple you and to train and prepare and to equip you, well, then you're following a different direction. But these guys are just offering something that in the mind of most men, I just want somebody to show me. Yeah. And they're the ones that are raising their hands. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't well, that the word, right? Where it says many are the, many are the plans of, of a man. Yeah. But God is the one that establishes them all. And the Bible also says that the, the steps of, the, of a righteous man are ordered by God. And so what does that word step mean? It, it, it applies process. And I think a lot of men today skip, try to skip the process. Yeah. And they get to this place where they arrive at this place that looks, that looks good, but there was no process attached to that arrival. Come on. And so men come behind that trying to arrive in the same space without process, it never works, yeah. right? And that's partly the reason what you were saying, right? Moses making it to the land, but not entering into the promised land for, for lack of, of, of obedience. Yeah, he didn't put in the work. Exactly. And After so because you don't put in that work. Too. Yeah, right. Absolutely. That's so interesting to me. Yeah. But that's the thing, it yeah. doesn't matter what you see, it's a matter, it's a matter of what, I can, what can I touch? What yeah. can I reach out and obtain? Regardless of what I've seen, if I can get there based on on your arrival, whether it was illegitimate or, or legit, then I'm gonna do my best to arrive at that yeah. place. Yeah, I had a mentor tell me one time, um, every, every overnight success that he'd ever met, um, every overnight success usually took about 15 years. <laughs> right. Yeah. But all we're seeing, because of social media, because of uh, technology, because of entertainment, all we typically see is the end result. And more times than not, that's not real. Yeah. It's not real. And there is no substance. I mean, that's what we're talking about, yeah. right? The reason why Jordan Peterson is a problem, the reason why Andrew Tate is a problem, the reason why these uh, singers and um, actors and, and, and movies and media um, is a problem is because typically it lacks substance. Yeah. It lacks depth. There's nothing real behind it. So you don't think men want anything real? No, I think they do want real. Yeah, and I think they they false they 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 chase after these these false idols. They chase after these false promises, right? I mean, what does Andrew Tate promise you? He promises you wealth, which we know will leave you dissatisfied, yeah. right? Solomon already told us that. He promises and the you the moss. He that's right. <laughs> Don't build, you know. He promises you lots of sex, which again. I mean, my man had concubines on concubines, right? A thousand or something like that. I mean, and at the end of the day, sex did not fulfill him. Yeah. Right? You, 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 you used to say something, um, the hottest girl you could imagine, right? Some dude's already tired of it. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, that's real, right? Like, like, like it's just not, not going to fulfill you. Um, he promises um, um, status, right, and influence, and celebrity, but but the reality is, man, that's just a perpetual loop of selfishness, um, self-centeredness, which is ultimately what happened to Solomon at the end. It, it really became about him. Right. He thought he was the center of the universe. Yeah. So they promised these things, right? Self-actualization, right? To be the best you now. They, they, they promised these things, but they never talk about what really goes into that. And at the end of the day, all it is is just this loop, man, where they get richer, they get more prominence, and you're still stuck in the same patterns. Yeah. And I think also what's being talked about um, or perceived in, in culture today, because to your point, the way up is down. Humility. Come on. Come on. Yeah. The way up is down. And we're delusioned by the fact that we see these individuals on the rise, but we don't, we don't submit to who's allowing uh, that particular person to rise, right, by way of God. 
So if we were to humble ourselves and submit ourselves under the Almighty, then he says that he will, um, he will promote us in due time or in due season. Yeah. But what does due season, right? What does due season really mean? Right. You know what I mean? And I think that we don't, we don't have the patience enough to wait through those seasons to be uh, elevated when that time is right. Come on. Mm. That's good, man. I think that's, I mean, patience, you're, you're, and, and what you believe is really the main thing. What, the way that you act is going to be uh, based on what you believe. And I think for so many of us, the reason we're not patient is because we don't believe it's worth it yeah. at the end of the day. We don't believe that waiting or pursuing something that people are saying, you know, pursuing Christ, you know, well, I can't see him. I can't touch him. I can't feel him. Right. And I've been trying to do this discipleship thing or this Bible study thing for a little bit of time, maybe a year, two or three, and I'm just not seeing much. So then we don't have the patience to keep going because we don't believe that it's it's going to do something long term. And yeah. so, but I think the more that we, the way that we enhance that is we 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 do spend more time with other people, like what you've mm -hmm. said before in the past and in community. We study more. I think the more I, the more time I get involved in God's work, the more I'm like, man, I want to do this nonstop. But the less I am, the more I'm like, I don't really get why I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. So. yeah. And and Manny, that's to bridge what both you guys are saying. That's because the process is not a destination. The process is a direction. Yeah. And so often outside, but even inside the church. Because what we're talking about ultimately here is discipleship, learning and becoming like something, Yeah. right? Whether I'm learning and becoming like Andrew Tate or I'm learning and becoming like Jesus, right? It's discipleship. But it's not a destination, which is what we typically treat it as. Do these three steps and X will happen. Invest this way and this will be your return, right? So the process is this destination. I'm here and I want to get here. But when you look at the Bible, when you look at the life of Jesus, man, real discipleship is a direction. You're not arriving. None of us have arrived, and none of us will yeah. arrive this yeah. side of heaven. Yeah. But what we can be doing is headed towards heaven yeah. or away from heaven, Absolutely. right? So when I think about the, the, the culture and these men we mentioned, the problem is they're not Jesus. That's the problem. There's only one way. He said it. I'm the way. The truth in life, yeah. I'm the way, yeah. right? Nipsey Hussle said, they follow me because, because they think, they I, think know I, I know the way. Yep. Right? That's why they follow me. That's what yep. he said. I mean, even he got it. Right? And he knew, well, I don't know if he knew, but at least he had heard Jesus was the way. Right. So, so when I think about that, man, when I think about a direction, I put everything through that grid. So I'm coming to this podcast this morning, and I'm sitting with godly men that I admire. Man, is that going to help me get closer to Jesus, or is it going to pull me further away? Yeah. And if it helps me get closer, guess what? I'm doing it. Yeah. This book I'm about to read, will that help produce in me godly fruit, or will it choke out fruit? And if the answer is choke out fruit, guess what? I'm not going to read the book. This movie I'm about to watch, this TV show I'm engaging in, this food I'm about to eat, man, if you begin to run that through that lens— is this producing godliness or is it choking out godliness? Yeah. Right? That's how we're going to grow and, and really mature and, and become more and more like Christ. But most people don't have that process. They don't even have that grid right. to run it through. So, Hart, I was just going to ask another question. So we've talked about Tate Peterson and all those guys and why men flock in that direction. Why do they not flock in the direction of the church come or on. pastors or Jesus? Or, or Jesus. Right. Because we make him look like a, a hippie in a white dress driving a Prius. Who in the world would want to follow that man? With a perm. With a perm. <laughs> yeah. Also, also I, I, I think, I think for most churches though, what discipleship means, and I'm, I'm going to throw a lot of churches under the bus with this, but what discipleship means for a lot of churches is Bible study. Come on. And, and that's it. Discipleship has to imply multiplication. That's it. If you are not multiplying, then you, I don't know what you're doing. But that's part of the reason as well. I think it's I think it's exciting 
when you're figuring out, man, well, I, you know, I've, I've seen this person and he's trusting Christ now. Now I'm working on this guy over here. And now, now we're growing over here and they're getting to know Christ better. And they're talking to other people as well. And we, and that's what Jesus had in mind. But so many of our churches are just about ourselves and about Sunday morning. That's it. And that's why they don't want to, that's why people, I think that's why a lot of, it doesn't spark that in a lot of guys because it's like, well, I, I do get something out of studying the Bible with a bunch of men. That's great. But that's not discipleship. Manny, the, the, the majority of men I've met, if, if, if I said, hey, are you being discipled? And they say yes. And I say explain it. The number one answer I get is I'm in a Sunday school class. Number one answer again. And that is not discipleship. Right. Now, it can be a piece of discipleship. 100%. But yes. it is not discipleship. Yeah. Right. So what I think, what I think you guys are, are describing, and I love this piece, right? You know, I'm, I'm the A guy, the B guy, the C guy, the D guy, all of those things, right? But you have, uh, what I'm hearing, you, you use the word direction a lot, right? And then at the end is the destination. If you point me in the right direction, then ultimately I want to get to the right destination. But in that in-between stage is that discipleship piece. And a lot of men can be pointed in the right direction. They won't reach the destination because they refuse to be discipled. And they and refuse saying, to dis end the disciple. Absolutely. Yeah. Because discipleship means accountability. Yeah. That means I'm going to tell you when you're wrong. That means I'm going to stand up to you when I feel like you're making a poor decision. I'm not going to comply with you just because you feel like doing it and you my boy. True discipleship is being able to say, nah, man, don't do that. I know she's been watching you for a little bit, but you got a wife. That's right. That's right. Go home. Yeah. That's right. And by the way, which is what Jesus would have done. Right. So, so, so back to my earlier point, we've got to stop making Jesus look like a punk. Right. Because he's not. Jesus was a grown man. And, and meekness, you know, yes, he was meek, but meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under control. Meekness is I'm going to withhold my strength, my wrath, my justice because right now it's for the betterment of your soul Absolutely. right it doesn't mean i'm weak it just means actually i'm in control right and we've painted jesus as this vanilla bland soft when when you hold cultural and and historic picture of jesus up to andrew tate man i'm gonna follow andrew tate because he promises me success money cars, women, right? He gives me everything that feeds this fleshly desire, right? So, so that's why I'm going to run that way or hold Jordan Peterson up to Jesus. Well, he gives me intellect, right? He gives me emotional balance. He gives me um, something greater to strive for, right? So hard. So then why, and I hate to cut you off, but I had to ask this question. Then Andrew Tate, you know, puts this grocery list of things that your heart desires, right? Right. How do you get men to want to desire something different? Yeah, the Holy Spirit. Right. And but you got to help them see it's not because it's not because your desires it's a C.S. Lewis. It's not because your desires are too strong, it's that your desires are too weak. You're satisfied watching porn when God offers you something better. Right. You're satisfied with fill in the blank. C.S. Lewis said it. God offers you a holiday at sea. This, rela this relationship with him that fulfills every longing in your soul. He says, I'll fulfill it. But you're content playing with mud pies in the slum, right? Yeah. That's what you're content with. So, D, let me ask you a question. What was one of the foods you disliked as a child that you now like as a man? Oh, oh. man. Um, I wasn't crazy about um, okra. Mm -hmm. You can eat okra now. Uh, anything green? Yeah. If I'm honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anything right. Green. <laughs> Just so how did you? Green. How did you get to a place now to enjoy? That's a good question. Those greens. Understanding the value of those greens. Oh, and how understanding the value. Yeah. Right. But in order for you to understand the value, something else had to take place. Because your mother been telling you to eat right. vegetables. Right. It's gonna make you strong. Yeah. Look like Popeye since she was eight years old. Right. But you still refused it. Yeah. At eight years old. You so it was more, it. you, you knew about the yeah. value of it. Yeah. Yeah. What else had to happen for you to begin to start eating these greens? Is that a trick question? No, uh, not a trick question. I what think, is it? Tell us. So I think it, it, your palate had to change. There you go. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Your palate had to change. And we're talking about manhood. But let me say something, though. 
for some of the things that I eat, I don't eat them because they taste good and because my palate changed. Mm -hmm. I just eat them because I know they're good for me. Okay. And I still dislike them. So there's a level of awareness. Yeah. But then there's also a palate change. Yeah. Too. And for men, and you just asked Harp this question, right? How do we get men to move in the direction of Jesus and separate themselves from those who are not? It has to be a palate change. There has to be an exposure. There has to be someone telling them the value of right. Christ-like men That's right. and being yeah. able to see that, yeah. you know, because we don't just go from, we were all, we, we all didn't, weren't born saved. Absolutely. Right. We did some things that Jesus would disapprove of in our day, Yeah. but we've come to a place to accept salvation and, and, and be transformed in the image and the likeness of Christ because there was a palate change. Yeah. It's real. And, and what does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? Absolutely. And I don't think, I think men would rather gain the world, mm-hmm. or at least what they perceive is that. Until, right. until there's that change. Yeah. And I love, and I think this is, and, and we got we to gotta wrap this up. We're going long, but this is good. This is so good. I think this was Lucado. Some will give him credit for this, even though if it wasn't. He said a person only changes because of four things. First, a person will change because he hits rock bottom, right? And he has to, and he has to. And when you hear people's testimony, you hear that a lot. Yeah, you I'm too old to pimp. That's right. I can't do it no more. <laughs> hit the bottom. You, you hit rock bottom. Right. The second reason people change is because they learn enough. They learn enough that they want to, right? And that's what you talked about. Um, you learned that the vegetables will help you look a certain way or will have this benefit for you, right? So you want that, right? The third reason people change is they see enough that they're inspired to. Man, I want to be like that. I want that. And there's, the inspiration is so strong, they change. And the fourth reason they change is because they receive enough that they're then able to. Because some, we don't all start. We don't all start at zero. Some people start at negative eight. Absolutely. Yeah. But you receive enough that you're able to. And when you think about that in context, us men, when you think about that in context of the church, we got to be ready to catch people on the bounce. Absolutely. Right? I hear rock bottom. I want to change. We've got to educate people. We've got to preach sound doctrine and good theology. We've got to paint the, the biblical picture of Christ, not the picture that we think he should be or want him to be or that cultural paints, but the accurate picture. Man, we've got to live lives that inspire others. Live godly, manly lives where other men look at us and say, man, I'm inspired by him. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Right? right? And then we have to, we have to love and we have to be kind and we have to be compassionate to bring people to a place that they're able to change. That's right? good. Nobody, nobody can hear you preaching Jesus over a hungry stomach. Boy, Feed somebody. You. Feed somebody, man. You and can drop the mic on that one. Come on. Well, we're going to cut it off. We're going to catch you all on the next yeah. one. Boys. <laughs> <laughs>